Hi. Hello. 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 Hello, and welcome to Architecting. I'm kind of a wannabe architect who had the great good fortune to discover early on that I really stink <laughs> at architectural design. <sighs> we always have these like crises of, of what is it? What are we doing? <laughs> and it's always when you're like finishing or you haven't found that next project and you're like, is this really the right thing? Yeah. And then you should be recording, I suppose. Yeah, uh, it is actually. And then yeah. oh, you can cut that out then. Yeah. <laughs> so there's these points where you're like, you're searching for the next thing and you're thinking like, is it really like, shouldn't I just go get a real job? Mm. Isn't that just much simpler? And then the, the upside to that, the upswing is that right project comes in. Yeah. And I think like, man, I'm so glad I've like done the work I've on, I've found the thing and, and something that becomes rewarding. Hey, hello, and welcome to Architecting. Uh, this is the show where we look at the act of being an architect, the people and the stories behind those buildings and the images. With our very interconnected international worlds that we live in, this show is purposely local and narrow. Uh, so we're only going to be focusing on Colorado community of designers. My name is Anna Wagner. I'm a Denver-based architect. I'm married to an architect. I have two architecture degrees from Kansas State and Yale, and I've worked for architecture firms in Wichita, Kansas City, Rotterdam, New Haven, Mexico City, and now Denver, where I'm at Open Studio Architecture and teach at CU Denver. I love being rooted in this, this Colorado community of designers for the last five years and love reaching out and getting to know other architects who I respect and admire. Now I've decided to broadcast these conversations and the stories of architects with the goal of creating a stronger community. So this month I've started the show and I've, I've broadcast two of these interviews over Instagram TV and I'll, I'll continue to do that. However, these weren't the first uh, interviews that I did. Uh, I decided to start this podcast back in March of 2020. And the, the first guest that I had, that I interviewed was, was my good friend, Brian Dale. So we met one night late in a in an echoey conference room in Open Studio in, in Denver over cocktails and, and talked for like two and a half hours. Um, it was a great, great time diving into his stories. Uh, and we were much closer than six feet and, and sharing in the same microphone. So, of course, that was the days before COVID and, and COVID hit kind of right as I was preparing to to get this out. And I just wasn't able to to keep producing the podcast. I kind of took took the winds out of my sails and it didn't feel all that important. Um, and so finally, last month, uh, I decided that that I thought that these stories, especially now uh, and how we've all been dealing with these times of COVID, uh, would be interesting to hear again. Uh, so I've started this podcast up again, but I I wanted to broadcast this story from from the good old uh, carefree times. So Brian Dale is is from a family of architects. Uh, his dad was Kurt Dale, the founder of Annis and Mason Dale Architects here in in Denver. He went to the University of Colorado and then to the AA Architectural Association in London before working for Zaha Hadid for, for nearly a decade. He and his wife, uh, Meredith Dale, moved back to Denver and started their own uh, great innovative firm, Sword Studio. So I, I stalked this couple at an AIA event, uh, thought they looked cool, and forced them to be my friend. And, um, and then we, we've even shared a co-working space together since then and, and taught together. So it, it great, gives me great uh, excitement to finally release this episode of Architecting You. And uh, here we go. Born and raised in Colorado. When did you, so obviously your uh, your Colorado architecture royalty <laughs> and <laughs> come, from, come from a lineage of architects. I think like, the idea of this podcast is that, like, I think I I I don't want to do much research and I want to like discover things about people, but it doesn't work with you because I know a lot about you. Just a little bit. Like, that's already there. I tried to do this for yeah. with Rebecca and it was, yeah. and she was just like, this doesn't work. But you already know that. <laughs> yeah, I know where you're going with this. You're leaving. Yeah, yeah. But 
Yeah, I was born, I was born here. I was uh, technically born in Inglewood because um, we I grew up in the kind of south part of Denver um, near Wash Park, and for whatever reason, was born over the border um, <laughs> into Inglewood. That's always bothered me, and I never answer that question truthfully. But it, it does say that on the birth certificate. We already have a hot scoop about <laughs> you on this podcast. <laughs> my, my passport actually it's misspelled on my other passport. So, <laughs> and I, and I'm like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. So the, the truthful answer is that, technically. But um, yeah, born, born into an architecture family. My, my dad was an architect, so I kind of grew up around it. Um, spent a lot of Christmas parties hanging out with other kids of architects and plenty of time sitting in uh, his office playing with toys that I still have. <laughs> blocks, lots of blocks, lots of Legos, lots of subtle hints about how cool it is to build things, um, and then lots of not so subtle hints about how difficult it is to actually be an architect. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, like, what you know, when you're saying like, like being around other architects and stuff, like, what did it feel? I guess it always just felt probably normal because that's all you knew, like, being around architects all the time. And um, yeah, it's funny because like I'll, I'll meet people or there's somebody. Um, who, who used to work at uh, my dad's office, who's, would ask, like, what's your, your first architect story? Um, and his first architect story was, was Ron Mason, was my dad's partner. And that's, like, the guy that he met, that he figured out, like, architecture is a thing. Hmm. And I could do that. And that's super cool. And I want to get into Like, that. before he went to school or before something? Before he went yeah. to school. And it's like, I don't remember. He was probably... Actually, I don't know the honest truth to that, but he was, he was not yet in school, and it was like he had never met somebody. And so, like, I've asked people that question, like, who's your first architect, and who have you met? Was it somebody you met, some friend of the family when you're, like, eight years old, that you thought, like, oh, that's a thing that you can do? Hmm. Um, and I never really had that. Like, it was just a thing that was around me that was, like, kind of a thing that you could decide not to do in a way. Um, <laughs> But I, I love the models, I love the like the drawings and the kind of artifacts of it. And I always thought that was super cool and had absolutely no intention of like realistically doing it until I, until I came time to go to college and had to sort of figure out what I was gonna do with myself. Um, I think it's funny, it's like, I feel like every architect you meet, especially in school or like application letter, they always have like that Lego story in there. They're like. I played with Legos when I grew up, and oh, that's yeah, how yeah. I knew that I was going to be an architect. Yeah. But that, but like you, you can take it like a step further, even of like, no, I had actual architectural models that like I was messing around with, and I always had it like, we, like we weirdly had architectural Legos, um, which I just thought were super cool, and didn't realize that there were other kinds or like. What's, it, what's our so we had this set and we still have it actually I've just given it so my brother's also an architect he's got uh, almost one year old and so I, I dumped some Legos on it that we've had forever but they're like you lay it out and there's an unfolded map of like a few blocks of a town huh. and then there's like little bits that make windows and doors that plug into the Lego pieces the coolest part is like the clear blocks to make sort of block glass windows or, yeah. or you know, glass brick windows um, and things like that. But it was like very architectural um, and was, you know, maybe subliminal, but we played with like tons as kids and I still love it. Yeah, so you still have it. Yeah. It's still, yeah. Obviously, it's still the, the, but like the honest Lego truth is like every kid plays with Legos. So yeah. It's like, it's not a, like, yeah. oh, then I was going to be an architect, <laughs> like every kid at some point. Just some people are like better at it than others, and they decide to try it. Well, to do some, it some and still do. Play with that's true. <laughs> it becomes a job. <laughs> yeah. So like so, so you were born. I mean, so your dad. When did you, when did your dad come here? And like, well, what, what was his kind of story of starting up in in Denver? Uh, so my parents um, both went to. Um, Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. They're Is your mom an architect too? Or? No, that's that's where they met. So okay. That's where my dad studied. He was from South Dakota. My mom was born in Chicago um, and then had moved to Ames. And so he started work after graduating from 
Iowa State, kind of locally there. And then they were looking to move out west and looking for projects and jobs and, and seeing what they could do. And then kind of had an interview in Boulder. This is mm-hmm. like mid-70s, mm-hmm. early mid-70s. And um, kind of had some other things, I think, lined up like further west out towards California and kind of got to Denver and decided <laughs> that this was... The car broke down. <laughs> <laughs> they saw the mountains and decided that this was kind of it. Um, so, yeah, so he, he had started working for... DMJM originally, um, the one big project that I know about, he, he worked on the old mile high conversion from football to football and baseball stadiums. So huh. they took the like stands of the old one and floated them and kind of huh. could move the stands out and change for, oh, for sports. So you got to work on that. Um, and we ended up having access or like getting on the list for season tickets for the Broncos <laughs> forever after that. Um, but then he started working for John Anderson, Anderson Architects, and then, if I remember everything kind of correctly, like he started there around a couple of years before I was born, so around when my brother was born, um, and then became a partner around when I was born, and then that was renamed to AMD sometime thereafter. Hmm. Yeah. It's like what, what, what do you, what do you see for like the the culture of architecture when he first moved here? Like, was there like a handful of firms? Was it, was it kind of in the boom time? And then like, Denver, what's your understanding of that? Denver's gone through kind of boom and bust and then tied into, um, tied into kind of petroleum mm-hmm. and, and the building of that. Like there's a lot of the buildings downtown that are kind of 70s, early 80s and things like that. and. Um, there's a lot of that's changed in the time I was away. There's firms that are still here, but have been rebranded or renamed. Um, but there's a handful of firms that have been around since then. What What are some of those? Um, well, like R and L was one, and they're now Stantec. Hmm. Um, there's a few that have had splintered off, and others that they've worked with. Um, but the names have all kind of shifted yeah. around since then. Um, but it was good, like the, the culture was one of kind of cooperation in sort of a nice way where at least one firm that I knew that I worked for a little bit, like they would share people when they had work or when they needed work, they would kind of, you know, share the resources between them and kind of work together to make, hmm. to make things, you know, work and be better here. So it's kind of always been that sort of ambition. Do you feel like were they were they like kind of connected around like CU or like a lot of people from CU or just because there wasn't maybe as many firms that like they could connect easier or I'd say it's like fewer firms. It was a smaller city at that point um, as well. Not everybody had that CU connection, but some did. So there were some of this like typical kind of teaching and feeding in to the firms and things like that. But, um, you know, it was Denver firms and the undergrad program was in Boulder at the time, so it was kind of more of a separation, I would say. Yeah. So, what kind of stuff was AMD doing? And like, were you kind of, when did you kind of become like more aware of like that work or? So they did a lot of work with um, universities and kind of higher education projects. And um, there was one in the kind of mid 80s for Western Wyoming College, which is in like Rock Springs, like hmm. Western Wyoming, obviously. <laughs> um, and I think I mostly became aware of that because that's where my dad would travel to <laughs> all the time for this project. And it was a big kind of massive deal for them, a big scale project and a big kind of um, one that they could kind of springboard into a lot of the other stuff that they've done here. Um, they've done, they did projects at CU um, kind of before and um, during the time I was there as well up in Boulder, I'm kind of working through some of those as well. So I don't know, like it, it was, it was never so, there's no moment where it clicked and it was kind of more aware of stuff. It just became sort of filtered into it. And if you asked, I, I would, you know, my brother, if you asked him when he was like, hey, what he wanted to do, I think it would either be 
professional soccer player or architect because you're Abe and that seems super cool. And like I would be a couple years younger and think like, yeah, that sounds great. I want to do what he wants to do. Um, that's just kind of funny. Yeah. You know? That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were... We were talking to like Gregory Crenshaw. It was like he was saying he, he worked for AMD and like would see you around, just kind of like hanging out. And um, but then you never really worked for them. Like, no, I spent one summer as an intern. Oh, really? Um, like right before college or the summer before I went to to undergrad. Um, and it started out doing stuff like uh, dealing with their kind of archives and organizing. You know, dealing with the kind of dead files and archives and things like that until I finally worked up the courage to say to Ron like hey I wouldn't mind doing something else here and built a couple of models for him before that but mm. that's, that was the only time that I worked there the rest of it was just hanging out I was the, the punk kid or the you know the awkward teenager more likely um, hanging out waiting for my dad to uh, to finish something up so we could go the, the sweeping floors and like <laughs> <laughs> My my dad was a contractor, and so like we would go on his job sites, but he would pay us like a penny per every nail that we could find. Yeah. And so we'd just walk around and find nails until we found like where he kept all of his nails, and then tried to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it like graduated on to like sweeping floors, and then it was like digging holes, and then it was <laughs> finally you get to do something, but yeah. No, we did plenty of that on the project. <laughs> yes. Digging holes, um, you know, spec house he was doing, and things like that. Definitely, like, life lessons about how I don't want to dig holes forever. Yeah. I don't want to sweep floors forever. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing that made me want to go into architecture, because I didn't want to be digging holes. <laughs> <laughs> you, now you just dig holes, but they're, they're not physical holes, but they're... Conceptual and virtual, and virtual uh, well, mental yeah, and mental, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so yeah, so mental holes. So after that, you went to college. What was the what was the choice there? How did you uh, decide? How did I end up in Boulder? Yeah. Um, okay, so the the short or the truthful, the real answer is I wanted to go skiing, which is why most people go to to see you in Boulder, is that they want to go skiing. Um, I, when I finished up high school, like the last, um, last year of my senior year in high school, I started working at Iscaria uh, at Bertha Pass when that was open, so mm. kind of on the way to Winter Park as a ski patroller. Um, and yeah, certainly if like things had been different, I may still be doing that. <laughs> it, was, it was like, I couldn't believe that that was a thing you could do. And at that point I was kind of volunteering, so I was doing it on the weekends. Um, wanted to keep doing that and wanted to stay in Colorado and was really looking through everything at Boulder and thinking like, do I want to do this or that? And architecture was the one thing that stuck out as, as something I wanted to, to try. And your brother, so you, your brother's older, yeah, and he so he went to see you as well. He did. So he was two years ahead of me. So I had a little bit. So of you get like, to see what you a little test, right? <laughs> a little to see, and he was doing some really cool things. So I thought maybe I'll give that a go. Like it sounds, it seems interesting. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. So I lived with my brother obviously until he went to college, and then moved back in with him at CU for a couple of years um, to to do the same program. And we actually had uh, so our neighbor across the street. Um, and then two other brothers that grew up maybe uh, five blocks away from us um, all went to CU Boulder for the <laughs> architecture program at the same time. <laughs> so I was the youngest of that, that group. That's, That's crazy. At some point, like, so we all did that and then went our separate ways to different, different places. And it's still in the back of my mind to somehow pull us all together and, and actually do some yeah. projects together. What do you think it, like, do you think that, like, if your dad wasn't there, like, would those other guys have, you think, have gone into it? Like, like was, it, was there something in the water, in the, in the air around you? Or completely. Like, so, my friend across the street, his dad uh, is an architect as mm -hmm. well. Um, the other two, no, but, and, you know, the, they are kind of 
balanced into or like kind of spread into other things like art and and um, actually one of them started out doing chemistry and wanted to do some, he was kind of wanting to build some things there that we realized he couldn't do and somehow ended up into, into <laughs> architecture but now I can't give my dad all the credit for that in fact when I when I'm sure he told my brother the same thing but when I said that's what I want to do and that's what I want to go study he kind of said are you sure <laughs> Are you sure that you want to do that? And you know, like made no mistake about the long hours and the effort that goes into it. And you know, in the back of my mind too, I know that he was also extremely happy and excited that both of his kids were going into doing the same thing. But he knew all the kind of pitfalls that were coming up. Um, and I was doing some of the like uh, first responder stuff with the ski patrol so he's thinking like wait a second you could do medicine like you could go be a doctor and, and my retirement might be covered in that case but no okay fine this is what you want to do like did you I mean did you see what you, you know it's interesting now of course like Anderson Mason Dale is you know it's so successful I'd say you know and it, it's it's doing such good work and it's kind of on it's like almost third round of principles maybe or, or yeah. like getting there and yeah. it's still established but like with him I mean could you really feel like that struggle uh, of a firm like it was it really feel like a kind of startup thing or did it did it like take off enough that like yeah there was long hours but like there was, but like one thing I learned from him, and I give him a huge amount of credit for, is like he was always there. So even with the long hours, like hmm. he'd end up going back into the office, hmm. right? Like he'd come home and you know do the dinner and do the bedtime thing and be there as a dad, and then he'd go back into the office. Hmm. Um, I think by the time I, I really remember stuff, you know, the the firm itself had been around, so it was Anderson Architects from. I know this from the archiving, I feel like it's 66 or 67, <laughs> something like that. Um, so it was somewhat established right before it became this other this other entity. But um, yeah, there, there was always ups and downs and good times and, and lean times for sure. Um, you knew things were going well when they started planning uh, trips to Europe and things like that. Okay, so you're so you're at you're at CU. Um, so what's the kind of feeling there at the time? I mean, like, did it did it have some kind of good buzz around it? Like, was was it good professors, good kind of um, classmates, or um, oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, I always feel like we hit it at such an opportune moment, and you know maybe hopefully everybody kind of feels this way, but. We had some young guys coming in um, to teach, kind of just starting out, who had just uh, done their, their uh, masters at Columbia, a few of them. Um, one, Ron Rael, who had studied at CU before doing that and kind of come back to teach. And these guys were like young, full of energy, massive amount of knowledge to bring back. Mm -hmm. And we kind of lucked out and got to have that span of three, four years of a few of these different guys, which unfortunately, like, and it happens at a lot of universities, that they kind of needed something more stable than the semester by semester kind of adjunct thing, and ended up going, and, you know, after a couple of years, dispersing to other places, but, I mean, Ron's the, the um, chair, I believe it is, at uh, Berkeley now, hmm. um, and hmm. doing some really amazing work. Who were some of the other guys, like... Uh, so there's um, Javier Gomez was one. He was an hmm. instructor of mine for one of my later studios, and he's in. I want to say he's in Seattle at University of Washington now. Hmm. Um, and uh, two guys, Patricio Del Real and um, Dave, and I'm going to lose the last name here. But they taught a combined studio, which has always stuck with me. Um, and some friends who have taken that one and kind of said similar things hmm. about it. They did a combined kind of studio on Broadway in Denver about media technology and velocity. And hmm. like this was our essentially second or third studio and throwing kind of 
some pretty heavy theory and ideas at us about you know what is a city and what can you do and what, what can you make with that um and you know pulling together i still have the drawings from that one like uh pulling together drawings with projection and all sorts of hmm. kind of fun stuff to 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 do where you don't always see that um especially when you're kind of saying you know you need a certain set of things on the wall and you need to be able to do a certain set of skills so that you can go work somewhere. Um, never had any of, of that. I don't know if we were very really? employable um, after we left. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, yeah. but the like ability to kind of explore, the like ability or, or kind of encouragement to explore was certainly a huge part of, of the university at that point. And so... You know, we had, out of my class, we've got, you know, guys who've gone to Princeton, to Yale, to um, Columbia and Sciarc and AA and, and so on, and the list kind of goes on and on. Who are some of those guys, like some of the guys you were closer with and went on to do some things? Um, well, one's Adam Frampton. He's a principal at Only If in New York now, worked for OMA before, studied at Princeton, um, you know, kind of impressive, impressive res resume. And other is uh, Luis or Luisa Fergoada, I studied with him at the AA uh, in London, he's in <laughs> Barcelona now, he also did a second master's at Yak and works for, uh, has run his own thing and works for McNeil for Rhinoceros, uh, hmm. kind of. <laughs> super, super smart guy. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's so interesting, right? Because, like, we we both teach, like, Studio 2 or 3 or, or whatever at, at CU now. And it's that, that like, battle between uh, trying to really push somebody and stretch somebody versus, like, hey, let's just – we got to get these fundamentals, like – I can't tell you how to draw a section again and again, you know, like it's a, yeah, it's a fine line in it. Um, it's interesting, like how much of your education, I think comes down to kind of like how you look out in one way or the other, possibly, you know, uh, of like, of like who you get, who happens to be at Boulder at the time. Right. Um, and I think like that's an element of it, but then also, you know, you are who you are and like, would you have found that path anyway, you know? that more conceptual kind of path. Yeah, yeah. I wonder. I wonder. I, I certainly give a huge amount of credit to the the instructors that I had there and the other like fellow students that you could kind of feed off of each other. You know, um, doing kind of installations as part as a product or a um, project within hmm. the building and things like that where nothing was too kind of well, maybe it should have been a bit more controlled <laughs> in, in Sacred in terms of what you could do, but like a lot of it, looking back, you know, maybe assumed you knew or could get those fundamentals of architecture and kind of gave you a better sense of, like, design thinking and approaching things that, like, it's all architecture, but you know, on the surface, is this really, and, like, you know, certain people would have, a, have an issue with it. We had a, a class called Social Factors in Architecture that essentially involved watching Apocalypse Now and Blade Runner and like Repo Man and a few other films and the guy, the instructor, um, brilliantly could tie this stuff all back to, to architecture. Mm. It was a required chorus and probably 50-50 you loved it or you had no idea why this was a required thing and what it had to do with architecture. I obviously fell on the side that loved it um, and you can see it kind of you can see that sense of thinking in everywhere you approach, and you can kind of take that and put it to anything, whether it's architecture or design or product or art or medicine or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always funny. Like, I feel like there's that fine line again of like being such a good conceptual thinker, uh, but then also like practically not being skilled to do anything or something, you know, like, <laughs> like sometimes I look at, like, I like the yeah, things I, you know, yeah. I did, like, I took, like, 14 architecture studios, and then sometimes I feel like I'm, like, color, 
color by number or something like at work, you know, or like, you, you know, or just like what kind of skills? Well, I mean, what, or, that's, you know. that's, a, that's a massive question of like what kind of skills does it take to be an architect? And then I guess what is an architect? And yeah. What do you, like there's so many, and I, I say that to students too because everybody comes in expecting it to be a certain way and everybody's probably a little bit surprised. And there's so many things that you can do with that kind of design degree that maybe your traditional architect building buildings, maybe you're much better at kind of visualizing things, maybe you're into the kind of technical nuts and bolts of how things go together, maybe it's broad brush, maybe it's a totally different industry. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're designing cars, maybe you're working in film. Um, maybe you're you're working in product design. Maybe you're looking at how to improve people's lives and health. Like all of these things can be solved by the way architects think, the way designers are taught to think. Yeah. So yeah, it's a fine line. I, don't know. I probably didn't learn enough. I like I resisted learning things that were straightforward and employable and I never learned AutoCAD until I found a job and realized to keep it I probably needed to learn how to do some drawings. I drew everything by hand in undergrad which really? was kind of crazy huh. um, which I should probably dig some of that stuff out. There's this symposium next week yeah. um, that I'm going to talk at and mm. yeah it, like you can't keep up, you can't possibly do work in drawings by hand but you learn so much by doing that I think and then just the kind of aesthetic and style of it and kind of how you present things becomes a whole other piece to it but I learned how to draw by hand which seems archaic even though we still teach it and then I learned how to build 3D models and only physical no oh. digital 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 so yeah and physical right yeah. I learned how to build like draw by hand build by hand and then I learned how to do um, 3D modeling. And once I started working, I realized that th at that point, 3D modeling was uh, a sort of um, added feature and not actually how you would get a building built and needed to kind of learn how to do some basic hmm. 2D AutoCAD and teach myself on the job. Because when did you graduate? When, when were you at CU? Uh, 98 to 2001. Okay. Yeah. A three year degree? No, it was it was four year degree. Oh, I, okay. So I had a huge amount of college credit from high school that applied. Huh. And so it ended up being a three and a half year. So it's the winter of two thousand. Oh, okay. So then you, you, you got out of there and then what are you thinking? What's next? Um, I think I need I need a job. <laughs> uh, I also again learning from my brother. So he went straight from undergrad to grad school, and I thought that seems like a huge amount of stress. And maybe hmm. I'll figure out. I wasn't sure exactly where I wanted to to go with things. Um, I did have a a plan that was all worked out to spend a year. Uh, working at, uh, at the ski area because at that point I was getting paid to ski which seemed insane and why would you say no to this um, and so but that didn't happen the ski area closed and I needed hmm. to find some other some other thing to do some other work and so I found work as a as a designer in a tiny architecture firm in Boulder where was that? Uh, it's Rick, Rick Epstein Richard Epstein hmm. Architects um, is what it was called at the time and yeah, there were three of us and doing commercial and residential projects. I started out building everything in 3D and that was kind of my thing. And, the, you know, being an int like essentially an intern straight out of a degree, being given some leeway to play and design and kind of have input into things really sort of slowly in the whole process. Did you have some good options coming out of CU? Like a lot of like good job market and like kind of a choice of like bigger firms, smaller firms, or was it like you you met Rick over drinks one day and you're like, yeah, this is the guy. <laughs> he he taught. So oh, okay. my last studio um, was the Solar Decathlon project, the very huh. first one, and um, it was with uh, Julie Hurt was our instructor. And midway through the semester, she 
was ill and Rick came and kind of took over the, the second half of the semester. Mm. Um, so it's one of these things that just kind of fell in my lap and it seemed right. I went for it. Mm. Um, but things were pretty strong in, in kind of 2001, 2002. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've met Rick a few times through you, and I, uh, yeah, I, I like him. He's a good guy. I want to try to have him on here. But so, what was that? What was that like? Uh, like your your first? Well, you, like that our early architecture experience with like the one guy, and like um, that that kind of environment. I mean, you know, like that you know working in like a structured firm is pretty different from like from like if some some one of our students came and worked for you or i or something yeah, you know like yeah, uh, yeah. good or bad you know like yeah. what what are some what are some what are some rick stories <laughs> i guess the, the the good side for sure was was the well I, he was super flexible i could kind of take off and do extra things on the side as I wanted to do and then also be able to kind of have an input even at whatever the age like what was like 21 right and being able to kind of have input into projects and designs and and kind of um, you know as a group kind of drive stuff it wasn't it wasn't top down you're working for me and this is what I want to do it was very much kind of like well what do you think what, what are your ideas right and I think that's something that um, that I've always loved and would want to take forward, for sure. Is the, the kind of nurturing of somebody who you think like there's something there's something here. I'm hiring you not just to do some work. Mm -hmm. I'm hiring you for you. Um, that I give them a ton of credit for. I think that's like the benefit of hiring your students too. I think right. Like you, there's a little more yeah. trust and like you kind of like, I talk to you. Like you know <laughs> their personality. <laughs> like maybe the the, the sort of setup is a little bit different but you know kind of what they're capable of and what they can do and if you if you mesh a little bit i think I mean, teaching is a very good way to kind of test out and see whether somebody is uh, hireable or not yeah yeah. Sure. yeah 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 uh, so what kind of what kind of work were you guys doing there uh commercial and residential both, so kind of multi-unit mixed use, oh, okay. um, and some office, and um, he had done some retail, but we never, hmm. we never did. How long were you there? Uh, these are short times, so probably two years there before I moved back down to Denver, um, and then worked at AR7, uh, which was, what was it? I think it had just become AR7, it was Hoover Desmond, so George Hoover, Gary Desmond. Hmm. Um, that was an office of 15 or so. Um, Amir actually worked there after I left, hmm. and a handful of the people that were there are now at Page. Um, but they're like similar, so they, they're the ones who kind of shared some, some work and some resources with AMD. They worked on similar kinds of projects, but rather than being sort of two outfits in town that would compete for higher education work, they would obviously be competing against each other. But um, I remember Gary telling me kind of the story of like, no matter who, you know, they'd both be interviewing for a project, whoever got it would inevitably call the other one and say, you know, good job and sort of, we're sorry, um, but like, we got this one, you know, you'll get the next one kind of thing. So super supportive that way. I thought you were going to say like, we got the job, do you want to be second in command here? <laughs> <laughs> I need a draftsman. I need a draftsman. No, no, that was more economic. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right, so you're there, and then at a certain point, you decide it's, it's time to follow your brother again, or... Or sort of, or sort, sort of, of leap, leap past. Is the, yeah. So I, I mean, he chose the better there. school, but like yeah, he, he, obviously, obviously, <laughs> I know that now. Yeah, yeah. Chose, chose your uh, alma mater. Um, yeah, that. So I spent a year and a half in Denver working there. Um, actually, live very close to where we are now in uh, Five Points in Curtis Park. And it's it's funny how like formative of a couple of years that was, but like living with some great friends, 
living kind of working down here and you know it's a time that I keep looking back to especially recently for some reason um, and since moving back here and just a lot kind of happening at that point and thinking like okay now I'm ready to see where I want to go where I want to kind of take it and, and what I want to kind of explore um, at the grad level so what were those 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 options for you I mean what, what were the top few schools that you were thinking about going to? Well, and when, when was this? So this was like so 2004. Four or five to apply, probably. So it started in five. Um, it was all coastal at that point. Coastal and then UK. So Cyarc and Columbia. New York was a big sort of obsession. So Columbia, Pratt. Um, I didn't apply to Yale because it seemed like I should probably find my own you place should, at that you point. It been long your brother enough. was like, you can't live with me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a, a sofa anymore. Um, and then the Bartlett and the AA in, in London, which um, some of those same instructors at CU you kind of say, like, what, where are the places to be? Where are the good places to go? And we all knew about Cyrac, we all knew about Columbia, but um, the ones in the UK were these kind of mythical places where like yeah. you'd heard about, but nobody really knew yeah. a huge amount at that point from them. And um, one, one Javier would say like, just go, I've studied the A for a, a summer a year or something like that. That's where you want to be, like go check that hmm. out. And so I ended up um, applying and visiting over there and kind of following in, in love with the place and the, and the school as well. Because at that time, I mean, like, like kind of digital architecture is really coming in, like heating up and kind of like blob architecture, kind of beginnings of that, I think. Or, you know, it like seemed like this, you know, Columbia was kind of at the forefront of that, yeah. right? And yeah. maybe it was peaking at that time there or. Certainly, uh, and, yeah, and I mean, Cyric as well, and um, so I, I went to the DRL and the A in the end, and in that program, we were the 10th year of that, and that was a total experiment to mm -hmm. begin with, um, but very much at the kind of forefront of digital and computational design, um, and I, I don't know if I really knew what that was when I started looking around and applying, I just knew what I was seeing was, was compelling and interesting. Um, and then digging into it deeper and realizing what it's about really kind of hooked me. So yeah, it came down to, in the end it came down to the choice of cities. It was New York and Columbia or London and the AA it was kind of the last two. Yeah. And I sat down with, um, with Ron uh, Mason, who was my dad's old partner, and kind of had dinner with him and I was like, I need, I need some advice here, um, you know where where would you go like what what would you do like i've got these options i guess honestly amazing options i can't make a bad decision here and he was like well obviously you go to london <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like without hardly even thinking about it obviously like there's your chance to go yeah live and work somewhere else abroad i mean okay so yeah it's still it's england it's everybody speaks English. It's not quite Europe. It's now not Europe technically. Um, it's sort of like the easy step to it. But that was kind of like okay, you know, what else am I going to have a chance to to do this? And so like, were you and Meredith like dating then, or like had been dating for a while, or no? We knew each other uh, through friends at that point, but hadn't been dating until after we were in. In London, so that's a few years later. So she, so she came there independently of you, like. Yeah, so she had actually lived there. She'd done her undergrad, well, diploma is what they call it, um, in London. Uh, moved there when she was nineteen to get out of uh, CSU in Colorado and and kind of go study art. Um, and you do a foundation degree, you figure out what you're gonna kind of focus on, and then apply. And she spent. Uh, yeah, her sort of four or five years of undergraduate there, um, doing her BA in uh, out just on the kind of outskirts of London um, there, and then had moved back over here um, after she'd finished, and ended up going back with, you know, around the same time. Hmm. Yeah. So, you, and you guys didn't know each other when you were both in Colorado? Or? Uh, no, we did through friends, oh, okay. uh, but only like 
a little bit here and there. Like it kind of, she would come back in summer times and had, had met her that way, but. I had no idea. It's so funny like no that idea. you have this like tie with like your neighborhood where all these guys are like architects and going to the same school, and then you go off to London and you marry a, a girl from Boulder. And um, the, the funniest thing is that like <laughs> when we'd meet people there, or you'd, you'd tell somebody you're, you're married and you're living there, or whatever it was, like inevitably somebody would think one of us must be British. <laughs> <laughs> one of us must be local, like, or one of us not. Like, and you're saying, no, 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 we, we you know, we met here, and so on, so on. And like, oh, but we're both from essentially the same place. Yeah. Like, what is <laughs> the deal? Like, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Um, okay, so you you decide to go there. Um, I mean, that's a yeah, it's a big leap. You um, you get there. What were the what were the kind of choices for programs within the A? I mean, it's, it's a pretty small school, uh, like in terms of students, right? Or... It is. Yeah, um, our program was maybe forty students. Hmm. Um, it's since probably maybe doubled in size for that piece. Um, the way and that's that, like all years, or that was like your class. That's my class. Okay. So it's it's also different. It's like heavily kind of theoretical. Um, so it's a lot shorter. Also, so it's a year and a half. So our our class was forty. Our kind of um, throughput there. There's um, a program called MTech that's fantastic. Um, Emergent Technologies. That um, is another one that would be super good. The the graduate programs that are all fairly self contained. Hmm. Um, so there is sort of a history and theory. There is a um, uh, housing and urbanism, I believe, and there's a few other programs within the, the graduate program. Um, but you apply kind of directly to the one that you're hmm. that you're interested in, and that was the one that I thought. And if like you don't get into it, do you get your second choice, or is that it? <laughs> I guess I didn't have you to find you out. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I you're right. Like that that's such a storied place. Like. Uh, especially like going to school at in Kansas and you know kind of middle of nowhere and like looking up to that school and the people the alum everybody that came out of it and um, it's like when when you're there do you really feel it and do you feel kind of this ivory tower kind of thing I mean like I suppose like well maybe that's just what we did to ourselves but there's there's certainly an amount of pressure on your on yourself um, but it's also kind of everybody. We worked in teams. We worked on the same project for a year and a half. We were mm. definitely kind of driving each other and feeding on each other and never leaving the place. Um, the year or two after us uh, decided to take Sundays off, and we thought that was completely wrong. And like, how could you possibly take any time off at all while you're here? Um, but yeah, you definitely didn't take it for granted. And like just the, even just the amount of amazing lectures that would come through kind of week after week was incredible. The resources there, the other people there, the instructors there, um, you know, I think it, it never hindered you. It was only inspiring. Yeah. So was it, I mean, obviously you had good, good instructors, but then would you have um, kind of lectures come in every other week or something and, and do a lecture for the school, or was it less formal than that? There were, so probably at least one a week, if not more. Um, I think this guy, it's probably two or three a week at some point. Hmm. Um, and guest lectures, sometimes they'll be there to guest teach something. They might be teaching, they might be a series. Um, so Mark Cousins would do a series every, usually every semester, kind of four or five lectures. Um, or they're, they're kind of visiting people. And sometimes those are tied into juries or tied into kind of reviews as well. So somebody would be invited to come and sit on the jury and then they would also mm -hmm. do a lecture and kind of tie that stuff in as, as we do too. Um, but yeah, like, you know, every other night there's somebody giving a talk and, you know, for the most part you're sitting in this tiny lecture hall in this little Georgian house on a square um, listening to Rem Koolhaas debate with Peter Eisenman or listening, you know, to, I don't know who else, Beatrice Colmina, or like all of these people kind of coming to speak and you're thinking like, wow, this is kind of incredible. Like I'm, 
three rows away from this. And it's, it's, it was never a kind of like starstruck thing. It was just like, I need to kind of wrap my head around this. I need to kind of understand what this is, what this is and what's happening and kind of see how I can work that into what I do. Yeah. Like where it makes it, th that idea like more attainable in a way, right? Yeah. Like that, I, those people that you study in school, like it's sort of more attainable, but then it, that proximity also like shows you the distance. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, from yeah. you to them, like but then how there's, far there's like right? now there's people I've studied with that do that, right? And yeah, it's kind of that connection that that kind of pulls through. I don't know. <laughs> well, what was one of what was one of those like uh, lowest moments in studio, or like just the, <laughs> one of those like those points that you know that that really comes to your mind. <sighs> I don't know. All right, so, like I said, we, we, we kind of split out. You, you sort of figure out teams without really knowing who people are. You, you settle into that. You have a chance to kind of change, but it's a, it's a big deal. It's kind of divorce yeah. us to say, like, no, I don't like you guys. I'm going to go join these guys. Um, but the great part is you sort of learn how to work collaborative, collaboratively with people that you don't get for the most part. That was one thing that kind of drew me to, to DRL was the way that it was structured. Um, so you, you have other people you can do more than you could do by yourself, but you're also relying on other people. And so, you know, it's sort of late at night and they would close the studio. So we didn't have open 24 hours. So mm. like we would have a jury or a review or, or a presentation the next day. And we'd all like pack our stuff up and go back to somebody's flat and keep working. <laughs> and there was a few of those times where we'd do that and then you'd look around and like the other three guys have all fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still working or you're the one who's like completely can't handle yeah. staying up and you're, you're kind of crashed out and somebody's kind of like I need this thing I need it to finish and you're like, what am I doing it's four in the morning and I have to deal with this <laughs> for, for that extra line that yeah, you yeah exactly for that one more rendering that, that one more drawing that's going to make a huge difference but now I know go home and get some sleep so that you can explain <laughs> what it is that you're working on yeah. because if you can't explain it there's no point. This is like partnerships in school are so funny, like in the weight that they'll have on you, you know, yeah. and like saying it's a divorce. Like, it's funny that you brought up Adam Frampton, you know, and we, we, I'm friends with him as well, but really good friends with his wife, Carolina. And our first uh, semester in graduate school, we partnered up on a project and Again, she's a great friend now, but she's very intense and very intense. <laughs> and we were partners for like two weeks and I was just feeling like too intimidated and, and, and just, I couldn't, couldn't do it. I couldn't be up at her level. And so like she went to New York for the weekend and like me and this other person like switched partners that weekend and like divorced. Uh, but, but then she ended up going on and like winning the award for best project of the studio. So I, I should have just hung on to her coattails but yeah, uh, yeah well now you know right? yeah now I know <laughs> um, so so there it's like you have you're essentially working on like a thesis all the way through for that year and a half like one, yep. one continuous project yep. and you're, you're kind of within that one one degree um, and um, who was kind of like leading leading you in that professor wise um so we had four uh, kind of co-directors of the program at that point. Originally, it was started by Patrick Schumacher and Brett uh, Steele. Um, and Brett Steele left the program to be the chair of the AA itself the year that I started. And so um, kind of the four instructors took it on as a, as a co-set. And those were the four who taught uh, the studio sections, which were all basically under this similar brief, right? And then um, also the additional kind of uh, lecture and theory classes that went with it. So it would have been uh, Patrick Schumacher, um, Tom Barabas, uh, Yasuki Abuchi, and uh, Theodore or Theo Spiropoulos. And Theo is now the, and has been for a while, the director of the program. Hmm. So, like, do those guys get along pretty well in, in terms of like direction or is they act pretty independent or semi-independently 
um, they all had the right, and like not right, but they all had the same kind of idea and direction, but like very different approaches to it. I would say um, Theo's kind of. And I suppose we had slightly different briefs. So one was about kind of housing. We all had the same site in East London, um, kind of pre-Olympics in that neighborhood of sort of what do you do with this area? Uh, that sort of brownfield sites and, and kind of um, urbanism and regeneration. Um, but yeah, they had uh, definitely had different approaches to things. Um, Yusuke is much more materials based and kind of materials computation. Theo was much more about kind of agents and sort of uh, like AI and, and kind of early stage sort of um, cybernetics. Um, and yeah, they all kind of had their different takes on it. And we sort of, you, you kind of fall in with one instructor and you kind of fall in with them, but you're sort of pulling in some of the others to say like, well, what do you think? And kind of what are your ideas here? And what do I kind of, mm. what do I kind of align with? And so then after that, you stuck with Patrick and went and worked for Zaha? For a lot longer than I thought. Um, <laughs> no, so the, the running joke, and I, I didn't know this when I started, which is probably a good thing, but uh, DRL split into two phases. So the first year is phase one, the second year is, or second 18 or nine months or whatever it is, is, is phase two. Um, and phase three is when you go work for Zaha. Uh, <laughs> Which like is is kind of uh, a joke, but also fairly true in the sense that like you are still learning quite a lot, and that it was a very smooth transition from doing this kind of heavily digital, heavily kind of theoretical and, and sort of exploratory work, and then going to work at her office and kind of continuing hmm. to do that. Um, out of those forty, we probably had thirty plus that went straight like Zaha's was kind of booming at the time hmm. so we a lot of us kind of went straight in and actually a whole group of us worked on a first competition together um, without a huge amount of direction and kind of um, with the same work ethic of never stopping that, hmm. we, that we had originally um, but out of that whole crew I think now there are still maybe five out of that year five or six who are still there um, all kind of super successful within the hmm. within the company. Very talented guys. One's um, I believe now design director. Um, Who's that? Uh, Paulo Flores. So in how long? So how long did you stay there? So I was there for eight, almost nine years. Um, That's so long. I so yeah, a year and a half at the DRL did not feel like enough time. Uh, in London or kind of doing that sort of thing and I wasn't ready to go yet so uh, but my visa was running out so I needed <laughs> to find somebody to sponsor me um, and find a place to work and I thought why not um, I think I actually saw Patrick give a, a lecture and, and show like loads of stuff that was happening in the office currently and completely fell for it and, <laughs> and gave him a call and said hey can I come interview can I come talk to you about working there and hired me on and I thought, okay, I'm going to, I can do this for a year, you know? He's like, we're going to get you a visa. It'd be great if you stayed for a couple of years. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I can do anything for a year. Uh, but now it ended up being about eight, nine years. Hmm. Was that hard? I mean, that was, when I lived in the Netherlands, that was my hardest thing of getting that work permit. I mean, I guess like once you got in there, like, was it still pretty difficult to keep that up? There, there were a lot of kind of hoops to jump through, um, and it's a lot harder now than it was, I would say, uh, because of the systems have changed and they've kind of made it more restrictive for jobs like architecture. Um, but once you kind of got the, the visa, um, there were sort of hoops to jump through to maintain it, but not terribly bad. Um, but I, I, again, kind of hit something that I had it at a good time. Kind yeah, like so, I mean, way. yeah. So she, when, so when was that again? So, uh, two thousand seven is when I started there. So that's when she was really kind of booming and like think things were finally picking up. And, yeah. And so what what was the what was the office like at that time? Like, it had to be weird. Like, I always kind of wondered like how a person like that, kind of a, an academic theoretical architect, all of a sudden has a firm of 
100, 200 people or whatever, like how well she kind of went to to management and I, th- I think we were 100 going so strong. something, 140 maybe <laughs> when wow. I started um, and maybe 400 and something when I left. Um, and not too long before that, we're probably closer to 20, 20 people maybe and not too long, like within 10 years before that. So they started getting projects built like Cincinnati and mm. like the Maxi Museum mm. um, and and some others that really kind of, like Wolfsburg was a big one, um, as well as the kind of BMW plant and um, obviously some things like Vitra that got, that got things kind of kicked off. Um, Patrick always kind of had a vision of like, we really actually want to build these things. Mm. This is not just theory, this is not just ideas but we we do want to build these and kind of it's a huge driving force in terms of getting things actually constructed how did those two get connected Zaha and Patrick uh as far as I know Patrick um uh, went to work for Zaha um he kind of left Germany and went to work there left to do his uh PhD, I, was, I, I believe, what's the, the right degree, and then kind of came back um, to work there. So he, they clicked. I don't know what else. It would cool. be like working on projects, and they kind of clicked, and uh, he was certainly her, her right hand. And I mean, I, you know, so she was, she was at the AA, and then kind of early OMA, and then yeah. for, for, for not very long, Probably and then and then just kind of split off and was teaching and like doing side projects kind of stuff or like teaching and doing projects and doing competitions and she she kind of won a couple of competitions that then didn't come to fruition so there's this kind of frustration she won the peak competition in, in Hong Kong um, somewhat out of nowhere with some pretty incredible uh, ideas and pretty incredible paintings, paintings and drawings yeah. um, and that uh, you know that never happened and then the same and, and even bigger kind of controversy, controversy I'd say is the Cardiff Opera House uh, that, that she won and with an amazing design and then just through backlash um you know, locally was uh, the project kind of never got off the ground and, and everybody, not everybody, but I would say a lot of people lament the fact that it never happened and that, that that project not only would have been a benefit to the city, it was just kind of an incredible piece of architecture. So, you know, those things stops and starts, but then a lot of those ideas kind of get carried forward and you develop that into the next project and the next one. And so what didn't happen there maybe happened somewhere else later on down the line. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I mean, it's just such an interesting thing where how, how much, what kind of like business vision did she have for the firm? You know, like, like again, going from working by yourself or with a few students on competitions to running a firm of 400 people, like, was she good at just kind of putting off that management and that kind of, on other people or was she good at like creating a structure that these visions could still run through you know because like and 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 everything was still Zaha you know like the style yeah yeah Uh, she had she definitely attracted and found like some people who are very much into it were very much part of the vision and and could help see that that forward and also trusted in people like that like Mm. the everything was was all Zaha we always kind of said we worked for her you know at the end of the day no matter what you're doing no matter what you're kind of designing we worked for her but youth and I'd say that too with with kind of DRL like youth was very much um emphasized and very much appreciated and kind of it didn't matter if you had worked there for 10 days or 10 years, if, if you had the good idea, if mm. yours was the good sketch, then potentially that would be the one that gets carried forward or, or good good idea or good interpretation of a sketch or whatever it would be. So, you know, in a sense, there, was, there wasn't this kind of, um, certainly not an old, old boys club or an old club of any sort, 
it was more, you know, are you any good? And, and what are the ideas and what are we doing with this? And, and is, it, is it kind of pushing forward what architecture can be? And I think that's what really drove it. And so, and that, that extended across every scale, right? Like that's up through scale of cities and all the way down through the scale of products and, and, uh, and you know, clothing and shoes and everything is kind of holistically like furniture. There's a whole design arm now that, you know, that became a major focus of hers um, later on. And did, um, would you work with her a lot? I mean, would you have a lot of interaction with her or by that point was she more disconnected? Um, depends on the project and depends on what, sh what you're doing with it. But yeah, we would. And she would see everything. She would, she would kind of either be driving everything or seeing everything and making sure that it was, you know, up to up to snuff. There was a project we did a competition where the team that I was on, we kind of, our project was sort of put on hold for a week and for some crazy reason we decided or or we just said yes that we would jump onto a competition that was due a week later that had pretty much not been started. Um, and so we jumped in and this is kind of like the first one that I got to really run the project from the very, very beginning and put this thing together, you know, this this kind of ideas and sketch for it that we thought was, was, was you know, pretty good for a week, but there's not a lot of time to kind of interface with her. And so we went and we met with her to kind of say, this is what we're going to do. And, and she looked at it and just went, no. no. <laughs> Like, no, 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 but this is due in, like, three days. And she's like, no, I can't, no, this is, no. And, like, after a little bit, her head kind of gets around, and she kind of comes around, to it's, it's, you know, it could work. But you got to take this side of it and peel it up. Like, the whole thing has to be stretched up this way, off to the, you know, to one side. So it became a much more dynamic thing, and looking at it and thinking, like, oh, no, i got to go tell my team that three days beforehand, we basically have to redo everything that we've done. Like every drawing, everything had to be redone. And at the end of the day, she was totally right. <laughs> it was far, far better. It was a hellish weekend, but it was far, far better. And was like up to kind of the level of being able to be hmm. something that was submittable at that point. I mean, she has a pretty, I mean, strong reputation, right? I mean, of being, yeah, of being difficult or of being uh, exacting, maybe demanding. Yeah, I mean, like it, she knows what she's looking for, <clears throat> she knows what she wants, and high, certainly high standards, and yeah. yeah, yeah. But you kind of expect that. Yeah, you kind of know that going in. I mean, it's such a hard, like thinking about like our own work, right? I mean that hard thing of, of when you bend over and when you don't, right? And like when you hold on to something and, you know, I, she just seems like such a strong example of like, of holding on to those ideas so strong that she lost competitions and she lost clients and then, but that, that vision wins out. But you also wonder how many of those, how many, how many Zaha's out there are, are have no projects and no, you know, how many have we never heard of? Right, right. Like or, she's certainly a, a special example. Or you, you piss off enough clients or whatever, and you don't have any more ever. But well, exactly like that that methodology, if that was even it. I think it was just really her personality and and sort of her vision and, and drive to kind of see these things to happen, and you know, get enough people sort of around you. Yeah, that are yeah. that are have that cohesive vision, especially at that time, I think with technology, it seemed like a kind of perfect storm with the AA there. And I mean, yeah, I mean, even if you look back at sort of the early drawings and paintings, like just the sort of some of the early techniques of kind of utilizing a photocopier to sort of stretch and play mm -hmm. with and distort perspective um, as a basis to, to kind of generate and do some of these paintings. And then I really think that the technology kind of caught up with what she had in her head. Mm. Um, and then there was finally a point where we could figure out how to build these things. 
and that's that was the it's not you know or at least that's a big piece of it of like getting off the page and onto the site um, is that things kind of caught up or we found ways to to kind of describe and and even just document and be able to kind of construct these things what was she able to keep up with the technology i mean like was she pushing digital modeling like and i mean at a certain point you can't keep up with it anymore probably but um, well yeah it's i think every firm like the the most up to date and, and kind of talented on that front tend to be the people who have just started right right or just yeah. coming in it's pretty yeah. tough to keep up on that but she certainly kept up on what was possible mm -hmm. right and she's always like, kind of pushing beyond and you're thinking like well how the like, <laughs> yeah if you're yeah. tasked with making this thing or modeling something and you're like well, how do i do that or you know recognizing what you could do with some of the kind of sub demodeling techniques or some of the kind of appropriation of other industries softwares and, and ways of working yeah hmm. so what was what was your big project there what were you working on most of the time um, I worked on a ton of different projects the one that was the, the biggest and longest um, was called Capsarc in, in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia um, and that project lasted from 2009 to 2017, I think it opened. So it lasted even a little bit longer than I did. <laughs> um, so it was an energy research center. It was our first lead platinum building, um, outskirts of Riyadh, basically in the desert, um, you know, more than 500 miles from anywhere. Uh, but kind of incredible project one where you know i think it was one of the first ones where we actually took an environmental approach to the design and really looked at kind of how environment can drive building and drive building form mm -hmm. um, so the whole project really looks the way it does because of where it is right and so some of that is kind of looking back and drawing on you know, the tightness of Arabic cities and the kind of wind-catching uh, towers of some, some places in the region and kind of seeing one of the big things there was, like, how can we make this building perform better? How can we kind of make it comfortable to be outside in a place where it's, uh, you know, pretty unbearably hot, especially in the summertime, how can, or even in the kind of spring and fall? How can we make it seem... Uh, a bit more like an oasis and a bit less like a desert. Mm -hmm. um, so that one sort of, it self shades, it captures wind, it has solar panels obviously to generate uh, power to it. Um, but we, we won the competition because we kind of tried to create more of these microclimates and environments. And so it ended up being kind of five buildings connected with this canopy put everything in shade, funneled wind in in the right way that was mm. cooling in order to cool the spaces, um, worked with some pretty brilliant engineers at, uh, at Arabs to, to kind of make this thing work. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing too, like none of these projects would happen without the other people, the other consultants that you don't hear about. There's, there's AKT, Adams Car Taylor, and Bro Happold, and, uh, and Arab. Um, on kind of structural and on um, environmental as well side that, that really kind of take these ideas and, and uh, you know make them reality yeah because that one of the one of like the genesis for this podcast was um, uh, Rebecca and I went back to Kansas State to lecture to some undergrads and and we were like, what's this lecture going to be about? And, we, and, and the idea we came up with was like, um, like you, you see all these glossy final pictures from buildings, uh, but here's the, the hard story behind it, right? Like here's the struggle that happens in each time. And, uh, and it's, it's really like made up of these struggles and these hard things that you don't see. Um, and so it's like, obviously the engineers are part of that, that struggle, but like, what what was that biggest moment for you on that project of like of like 
this is this is crazy or like this like you know because now because now we can all, I'll put like pictures on online of it you know and it's a beautiful project and it's this it's, it looks like this beautiful perfectly digital digital crafted thing right but like oh, it was struggle every day right I mean, like, it's the insanity of trying to deliver a design on that project in a year um, <laughs> a year yeah the original constructions it was just like the ambition was not right. They wanted to design it in a year, build it in a year and a half after that. And we always told them it's not possible. But, you know, we'll sign up to it without, you know, without reservation knowing that this will take as long as it takes to kind of get it to happen. And at the end of the day, it was kind of oh, an average length for a project of that size and that kind of complexity. But I don't know. I mean, there, we had a, a shared office on that project. We spent... I spent more time away from the office on that one than any other project, obviously. But we, at, at one point, we probably had 50 architects from our office, 100 engineers in total, maybe 20 from the client team all in the same office, um, and trying to deliver kind of package after package for it. And in a way that you're like, you're thinking to yourself, this isn't finished but it has to go out right like it has to go to be bid so you had to be kind of careful about how you know how complete things were and you know at what point were you saying okay this is finished we're going to bid it and then we're going to take it and continue working and somehow there's this like massive change order that comes after that potentially but i don't know delivering everything by uh by paper was also kind of <laughs> insanity. There are certain things in the project were just kind of crazy, and we said, you don't need drawings for all the steel, you just need a model, hmm. right? And even that at that point was such a foreign thing that they finally agreed to it, but we also had to deliver drawings with coordinates for every piece of steel in that project, and there was a lot of steel in that project um, that I have no idea if anybody ever looked at. But yeah, there was a lot of late nights in there. And, and, and some great times. And so, like, an awesome, very intelligent, very brilliant team that have now kind of split off to do their own things, a, a number of us, and all doing kind of some pretty, pretty rad work. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, so, so you left. What was, the, what was the, the decision there? I mean, and the kind of timing around that. So our first daughter was born in London and she would have been about a year and a half when we left, um, and which is kind of nuts. Our younger daughter is a year and a half now and she seems a lot younger than, <laughs> than, than Lena did when we moved. Um, Lena was more sophisticated. She was more oh, British. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it was the yeah. accent completely. Um, but so we, we did that. Uh, some other friends were kind of leaving London. It seemed to be sort of a time where it's, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing place. It's kind of, it's also very, uh, you got to work pretty hard in, mm. in that place. It was kind of time for, for that change. Um, still had family in Colorado since we were both from here. It seemed like a pretty obvious place to, to start. Um, and decided to kind of jump ship and, and move back across the ocean. Um, we extended a little bit. It was a good project I was working on in Cambodia that I really mm. wanted to get built. Um, that's that hasn't yet, but uh, beautiful um, and very kind of amazing client and uh, and project for that one. So it kind of pushed it out a little bit, and then finally it was time. It was time to kind of um, do something a little different, have a little different pace. What was that decision like when you came back to start to start Sword Studio? Like, did, did you think about coming back and, and working for somebody, or um, was, it, was that just the, the plan, the goal? Um, we, uh, so we, I looked around, we both did, we thought, like, so what are we going to do? What are we going to do now? Like, I, you know, people need to work. It'd be great if we didn't, and we could just do whatever we feel is, is comfortable and, and kind of play and, and so on. Um, but we looked around and, and we thought like, well, if we're ever going to do something like this, and we'd never actually worked together before, aside from like redoing our flat in London, right? And I'd help Meredith on, on her sort of product and, and kind of textile product design side a little bit and kind of 
done some web stuff and photography for, but we'd never properly worked together. And we're thinking like, we each kind of have a thing we want to do. It's maybe a little nuts to try and start two different businesses at the same time with a year and a half year old and moving halfway across the world again. So why don't we just try to do it as one business? We'll just try to start it together. And so, I, you know, there, there's some good work happening in Colorado and in Denver. I wasn't kind of uh, anything jumping as like the next thing to do. And I figured if there was a good time to do it, it seemed like that was the, the right move to make, the right jump to make. It's such a big jump, like like the the scale of a firm, the, the complexity of project, just the scale of project, like yeah. So how, going from four hundred to two, um, and dealing with a hundred engineers on a on a billion dollar right. project to what what you have to switch to as a sole person. I mean, yeah, let's. Things are a little different. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I, I sort of thought, like, I can get back to doing, because I love every sort of aspect of the, the process, mm -hmm. and, like, I can actually draw stuff. I can actually do the, the design and the modeling and everything, and um, without really thinking too hard about, like, oh, well, now I need to kind of be the one who finds the work, and then also run the business and do the kind of, all the kind of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Um, but certainly like the, the scale of stuff has shifted. I feel like the kind of ambition and direction of things has not changed a huge amount. Like I, I still, we still do projects. And so our backgrounds are quite different. Um, hers is more in making products, arts, and mine's obviously more in the kind of more traditional architecture side with this sort of conceptual and, and kind of artistic uh, focus to it and so originally so it was this kind of broad thing that we could both do our own stuff underneath and it's sort of melded into something that we work very closely on projects together but those projects range from things at kind of a product scale up through sort of building scale so we're not we're not doing entire cities we're not doing half million square foot office projects um, but we are kind of working across a range of scales and a range of different types of projects. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I think it was fun sharing uh, space with you and, and, and Meredith and like watching you sort of work. Like y you would be kind of pounding away at, at something in Grasshopper and then she would come by for like an hour and just pull out some paper and like cut some stuff together and, and be like, no, this is what we're doing. And you're like, oh yeah, that's... That's good. And okay. then you would yeah, like try to go back to Grasshopper and like replicate it yeah. and like yeah. figure out how to laser cut it. And, um, but but it's yeah. It's like kind of back and forth. It's been, it's been great. I think it's a lot different than just purely starting something by yourself. Yeah. Right? Like you've got that, that kind of collaborator. You've got that kind of person to bounce ideas off of. Um, you know, and, and those ideas are coming from different directions potentially and see and they morph as they're going to go back and forth between us. What's like the, what's the vision for the firm? Are you able to, are you able to have that or is it kind of a, a daily thing? You know, like is it, is it, is it building it up into a 40 person thing that, that you each have a silo or is it? No, I, I think it's certainly a work in progress. And the vision as well as a work in progress. It's something that we've spent the last four years trying to, mm. to articulate, I would say, and, and get beyond the we just kind of like doing cool projects. Like, where does that take you? Um, so the last sort of few projects we've been working on that, that kind of fall into a more public realm, a more kind of art-based realm, um, into kind of exhibitions and into um, even public art projects and installations like that's where we work really tightly together and where we're both kind of driven and interested in it so I think if we can kind of carry that forward I don't necessarily know if it's going to be just us or five or ten or whatever in the future but it's more about kind of making an impact with the kinds of projects that we're, that we're interested in that, that keep us keep us entertained and also kind of allow us to experiment and allow us to kind of test out ideas 
Um, and finding the right people who want to do that is, is where that, where that goes, whether that goes towards, you know, self-fabrication or whether that goes more towards kind of, uh, art projects or whether that goes more towards, um, you know, more traditional architecture. We'll, we'll see. The whole thing's been pretty organic as it goes. And I think part of that is is how we like it and how we kind of want to see. And we're, we're starting to kind of be able to direct it a little bit more um, as we have spent more time doing it. Um, but certainly I think it's always, it's always a work in progress. It's always a kind of, which is great. It's just something where we can say today or tomorrow that this is the kind of thing we want to do and go after that or, or we don't want to do this sort of thing and we're not kind of locked into a certain type of project or a certain type of even product mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're kind of producing that you're getting into um, yeah it's got like it's obviously difficult as well right like <laughs> you're sort of constantly forcing yourself to do something that you maybe haven't done or aren't you know aren't as comfortable with but or aren't sort of experienced with necessarily or on the surface aren't and like how you how you drive that um in different ways i think is what i find super interesting yeah and there's not the same there's, there's not the support that you have at a larger place where you can just easily know. ask the questions i mean but i think i think that's what what i find really interesting about you guys is is your um ability to keep exploring and even if it's at these smaller scales and and like like the kind of self um projects that you put on like um you know you, you started up the that kind of pop-up movie theater within the alley um and then the first project i saw you on with with that little um kind of morphing wood framed project on 16th street mall and it was you know, it was like so profound. It was like right kind of when I moved here and it was profound enough that I, I stopped and I was like, who, who are these guys? And I like looked you up and then, and then it was like a AIA thing a few weeks later. And I saw this couple and I was like, those people are, are not from Denver. I mean, <laughs> you, well, you were, but, but I was like, those are some cool dudes. Yeah. And I literally like stalked you and I like looked at your name tag and I was like, Sword Studio. Oh, that's where I saw it before. And then I actually stalked you at the, at the award ceremony and said, hey, you, you want to, we should hang out sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, I mean, I, but I mean, I think that's what, what, what drew me in, in to you guys in the, especially within Denver of, of like pushing with that and pushing with these smaller exhibitions and like, because it is so hard when you're when you're on your own and like the things you have to do to keep the lights on versus still pushing your your vision and your project your you, you know your 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 whole project architectural project forward it's it's a real struggle i mean so the one you're talking about the uh, the timber one was um our one of our first projects definitely our first one that we fully collaborated on um, and also the smallest budget on a project we probably ever had. It was, it was for a kind of pop-up um, prototyping festival, and we took the stipend as a maximum ideal, hopefully we don't go too much over this amount that we'll spend on materials. And so even at that point, we're like, Here's, somebody's going to give us a chance to play and, and experiment, so we're going to kind of throw everything into it and it's still one that I go back to it's still one that I love and I think it's it like it carries a certain sense of simplicity and also um, also complexity at the same time and kind of does a lot with a minimal amount of material and the chance that that kind of project I love because it gave us a chance to experiment and those are the kind of clients that are that are fantastic and you can't find everybody that way who's kind of willing to let you play and willing to let you kind of experiment and sometimes you kind of have to do those yourself you kind of have to um take those on and and put some some sweat some equity into it and sometimes you have to fire up the the saws and build them in your backyard i don't know yeah <laughs> at two in the morning and yeah. after the girls go to bed yeah. and after it does yeah i mean it's that 
that Zaha model, right? Of, of trying to have that vision and push it through and, and hope it attracts enough people, right? I guess, or... Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, like, you know, you're not really doing it for yourself, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you are, obviously, yeah. but you don't want to just be doing it for yourself. And, um, yeah, trying to get the, get the things out there into the world. Honestly, and maybe, you know, hopefully we'll see if I'm proven right or not, but I feel like if, you, if you're doing good work that you can put out there, then hopefully you can continue doing that. Yeah, uh, I think it's good. Hopefully we do some. Yeah, so I saw I saw Meredith calling. So you gotta go. It's it's getting late. But <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking through like if there's a through line in this in this podcast and thinking about like um, that idea of the of the sort of uh, the hard things underneath the glossy images. So if if you had to say like what what would it be your the lowest point in your architectural career, and then what would be the the point that kind of gave you the most energy and the most um, excitement in life. Oh, that's that's heavy. Um, you got to work for that old-fashioned there. Yeah, completely. I might need another for that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, like, the lowest point. I think there's definitely been some late nights and some points where you're thinking, like, is this... Is this worth it? Um, certainly the higher points are seeing things happen and seeing things built and kind of opening things, I think, you know, or or even just being shortlisted for something that you didn't, you, you weren't sure, but you'd really love to get, which happened to us recently. We got shortlisted for, for a project that, like, is a new kind of thing for us and is fantastic and that's that's definitely a recent sort of highlight and kind of um i don't know like having people appreciate what you're doing yeah it's kind of as simple as that and it's it's like you you've got something that you want to kind of express and and getting some kind of traction with that so i don't know maybe the highest and the lowest points have probably come in the last four years of kind of where does the next project come? And then sometimes they, they roll in and they're fantastic. And that that experience is certainly the roller coaster. You're not insulated in it at all, like you would be in a, in a larger firm. Yeah. Um, I mean, because in general, like a lot of times those hardest nights are paired very closely with the the, the best times, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, it's, a lot it's of times, like the, the night before, yeah. and then it happens, and like there's the night of struggle of like, this is everything I'm doing is horrible, and this, this will never work, and then kind of an extra half an hour, or go to bed and get up the next day and look at it, and, and hopefully it kind of comes around. Yeah, architecture. <laughs> cool. You feel good? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that was good. Thank you. I think what we'll, grand experiment beginning. I'm happy right. to be your first one. This is uh, it was fun. Curious yeah. to see where you take it from here. Me too. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks. You can visit architecting.com. That's architect-ing.com to see images from this week's guest. And please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a great week and keep connecting.